You are listening to the Roberta Glass True Crime Report, putting the true back in true crime. From New York City, Roberta Glass is now on the record. Okay, we are live. Welcome. I hope you're having a good Monday. It's always a very sad day in New York, remembering September 11th and those that we lost. And very, I remember it, you know, so well. I was living in New York and uh, I was working. And then it started like buzzing around the office that plane had hit and we and we had no context to to this first everyone's asking is it an accident and um my friend's roommate uh Aaron Horwitz died I worked for Cantor Fitzgerald extremely nice guy so remembering him today and uh, many others so yesterday we left off, we were looking at this amazing, I, I really thought I was going to spontaneously combust listening to this interview yesterday. Just amazing claims made left and right by these filmmakers. And it, 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 it continues to, to get interesting for yesterday, they said that they 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 were really weren't making a documentary about innocence. They were making a documentary to raise questions, and you can imagine what kind of questions they want to be raised about our criminal justice system. Is it how can we make it more fair? How can we make it more defendant friendly? Those are the kind of questions they want asked. Not what happened <laughs> with, with the first Stephen Avery's acquittal. And if we have time, we're, we're going to look a little bit more at the Stephen Avery's acquittal for his, the assault on Penny Bernstein. So right here, they start out talking about ethics, and I think it's a good place to for us to start. The next question I have is, uh, what are some of the ethical issues? And this is, you know, kind of touch on some of these challenges faced by journalists and media producers when working on a documentary or project about true crimes. I don't consider myself a journalist. Mm -hmm. I consider myself a filmmaker. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, certainly, I mean, there's a way in which, you know, I have a sense of. Just note, she doesn't consider herself a documentarian. She considers herself a filmmaker. Right. So I guess we should start calling making a murderer a film. What ethical obligations there would be. It's, it's not as though, you know, as a lawyer, you know, there's a code of professional conduct in the States and, you know, you can open a book and read what the actual rules are essentially right. and and guide yourself accordingly i don't know that anything exists like that for filmmakers um that said i think that you know it's i mean with the way this is going between paradise lost and all the other documentaries that have been made that have successfully released convicted killers the case against adnan syed is one comes to mind and this, maybe they should have a code of, of, of ethics. This is a little different than making a Hollywood movie. And they've even combined the two with when they see us. That's really a combination of both of them. Uh, both it's kind of, it's just a Hollywood movie based on a true story. But most people think that that is a documentary or even accurate. And it's so, I mean, it takes such liberties. And that'll be an interesting uh, lawsuit to 
to watch, of course, in New York, the lawsuit against Netflix over when they see us. It's just an eight, really. Um, I mean, we were guided by our own set of ethics, I think, and just by who we are as individuals and as a team. And for us, you know, um, great time to, to jump in and say, oh yeah, what are those ethics? What are your ethics? What won't you do? Because we know that you'll edit sworn testimony. You have no problem doing that. You have no problem leading, leading, leaving out a lot of really important facts and evidence. What, what, what won't you do? You have no problem obscuring the victim and embedding yourself in team defense. And you have no problem making a love letter documentary to a man who was described by the judge who presided over his trial as one of the most dangerous men ever to, the most dangerous man ever to grace his courtroom. There were certain criteria. I mean, if that doesn't give you pause, I don't know what would. Criteria that footage had to meet in order to make it into the series and materials had to meet in order to make it into the series. So in a way, I think we were doing what I imagine journalists do, which is, you know, we were trying to use primary source materials. We were fact checking. We were, to the extent possible, corroborating um, before using any of that material or footage in the series. So, you know, obviously we were working as thoroughly as we could. We had more than a thousand hours of footage. I just, I mean, we'll go over what, <laughs> what making a murderer left out, but that's a, a subject for another day, but it is a quite extensive list. And if they couldn't fit it in, 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 in part one or part two, then they're never going to mention it because my opinion is they left it out because it made Stephen Avery look bad. And that's what you're seeing in convicting a murderer is his really scary history with women, children, animals. I mean, everyone else's stomach is turning listening to this, but not these filmmakers. They can't wait to to right, go out and and get them out of prison. I think that's really their goal. And also to change the criminal justice system, make it even more defendant friendly than it is already. We had, I must have read tens of thousands of you know, pages of documents from, uh, there were at least, I think five legal matters that you know we covered in the series. There was uh, the 1985 wrongful conviction. There was the attorney general's investigation and ultimate report questioning whether there had been criminal or ethics violations in the 1985 case. There was um, the Avery task force. I love how she leaves that report just there, that uh, report questioning whether there were ethical and legal violations. Um, my understanding is that that report concluded there were none, but I love how she leaves that out and just says, well, there was a big report done about possible ethic violations and, and legal violations. Oh, that's very concerning. Very concerning. That's what she wants, wants you to feel obviously listening. Force that was formed. It was a legislative task force with a goal towards you know, how can we prevent this sort of thing from happening again? There was the federal civil rights lawsuit that Steve Glenn and Walt Kelly, who were representing Stephen, helped him bring, um, you know, to try to address any alleged malfeasance that had occurred in the first case. All of that before you even get to the Hallbuck case. And then the Hallbuck case was touted as the largest criminal investigation in Wisconsin history. So. You know, by the time we got to even looking at the materials in the Hallbuck case, there was, you know, there was so much available to us. And we knew that we were telling a 20 plus year long story and that for us, we would be gathering the materials, doing the research, trying to understand as deeply 
um, and as broadly as we could the material and then trying to distill it and you know to tell a compelling story mm -hmm. and try to maximize viewer engagement right you know we also made the decision going in um, in terms of talking to people that we always wanted to we were only interested in talking to people about their firsthand experience you know we, we don't have any you know experts in the field just talking about the concept of something it's somebody who worked on the case or and um so in that way there's there was a i mean that's not exactly fact checking but you know people are only speaking to their from their from their experience and that's all they're allowed to talk about that's very telling. So she's basically saying it's like their testimony. We're taking their testimony. And it brings to mind what someone would testify to under oath, but it's very different what you can tell a documentary crew and what you can tell what what you can say under when, what you can say under oath. Just for what the the rulings the judges made as far as what's allowed in topic wise evidence wise and of course the ramifications um are much more intense it's perjury for lying under oath but no problem lying to a documentary crew yeah. so there's a certain subjectivity to that but it's also broad. Right. Even what I mean is that there's an American idea and, and that's very popular that we don't need experts that, and I don't mean that not their use of experts. That's a stylistic choice. I, you know, of course, if I were making this, maybe I would get some experts on psychopaths. I don't know. <laughs> maybe get, bring some context to, to, to Avery. Uh, but, but what I, what I mean, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. I'm going to take a quick break and, um, and I will be right back after this short break and I'll meet you on the other side. If you are enjoying this episode of my true crime report, please hit the thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and share this episode. Get access to exclusive podcasts and other bonus content by becoming a patron today. If you have a question or comment for me, shoot me a super chat and I'll do my best to answer it and read it on air. Thanks so much. Now back to the show. So what I was saying was there's this idea that maybe that the, that the filmmakers can get to the truth better than our legal system. And because they're novices, they can do better. They can cut through all that red tape. They're not, you, they're not constrained by, by our legal system and that they'll really get to the, the bottom of it. Oh, shall we? I'm just going to return to a little of this, and then and then I have quite a shocker about Stephen Avery's 1985 trial. So let's just return to this for a hot minute before we move on. And once again, there she's filmmakers are talking, speaking with the I. Ireland's Innocence Project. So I think some people, and I'd be interested to hear what you have to say, some people have sort of complained that you have left things out and that, you know, shaded this story mm -hmm. uh, in some way and, you know, questioned your ethics in that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Some people like the prosecutor, <laughs> Ken Kratz, and look... You know, there's about been like a million stories, including one ABC, I think it was 2020 piece on in entire entire episode on what they left out. 
So if there was enough to make a 2020 piece, certainly what they left out was substantial. What would you say about that? Um, well, I disagree with those people. Um, <laughs> I don't think they know as much about the story as they would like to let on. Yeah. And they know nothing about our process. So, you know, they well, of course, Kim Kratz isn't going to know about your process, but I think he knows a heck of a lot about this case. Knows, uh, I would even gamble to guess maybe even more than you might know, Maura. Am I crazy? You could ask us about our process and we right? could discuss, you know, specific things with them of why that, you know, I've heard a lot of accusations. Why didn't you put this in? It's like, well, because if you look into it, it's actually not true. Right. That's why it's not in there. Yeah. <laughs> Good for you. Good for you. Good for that vague claim that you never have to back up. You never have to prove. Boy, Kratz didn't have that luxury. Boy, they left a lot of stuff out. And they're wrong. He doesn't have to explain why they're wrong, what it's about. Just make a vague blanket statement. And, and, and the interviewer doesn't ask a follow-up. It just cheers her on. Great. Good for you. Good for your vague non-answer. Thank you so much. Uh, I told you I might spontaneously can buzz watching this. But, uh, you know, also, um, you know, obviously people can question our process. That's valid. And we, we could respond if given the opportunity and we're happy to respond. And mm -hmm. we think that our work stand, would stand up to any scrutiny. Um, but beyond that, you know, and this sort of gets back to the initial question of innocence. I mean, we did not assume an advocacy role here. Right. You know, we were not interested in having an impact. In fact, we worked very hard not to have an impact on the cases. Um, okay, just a question. How do you see, set out to change the world but not have an impact on the case that you is the subject of your film series. How does that work? How do you make a documentary about a case and expect it not to have an impact? Yet your goal is to change the world. Okay. You know, we chose Stephen's story. He was a vehicle for us in a way. I mean, um, yeah, it was a vehicle <laughs> to a lot of blood money. You know, we, we received the James Joyce Award last night, and I was, I was looking up some things about Joyce, and there was one quote in particular, it was something to the effect of, you know, um, through the particular comes the universal. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, so here we were trying to tell a human story. Stephen Avery was a human face about, you know, the functionality um, of the American criminal justice system. And so through the particular of his story, we were hoping to raise bigger questions, bigger themes, um, and not only about the criminal justice system, but more about, you know, who we are as a people today and, you know, questions of identity and mm -hmm. how we relate to one another. How do we treat people who are different than us? And Different or psychopathic? How do we treat people that are different than us? Or how do we treat people who, ha like the Avery family, are a criminal bunch? And, you know, I was, I feel like having gone to Sarah Lawrence and, and being raised in a very far left family, activist family, what I hear her saying is, that we have to treat treat criminals better, psychopaths. She doesn't think she doesn't think they exist. I would think They're, that's out of off her radio, but it, <laughs> that's what she means. E everybody who's in prison, like they're you know very gently, very gently, <laughs> I, I guess, and cut it off at twenty years. We don't need to give anyone any more time than twenty years. I bet she's on board for that too. So, you know, questions of fairness, um, of institutional power versus individual rights, 
you know, these are the things that really concern us. So when they mean institutional power, they mean the big bad legal system up against the the adorable, lovable, huggable Stephen Avery and co. Doesn't matter what the reality is. I mean, in the beginning of Making a Murder, I encourage everyone to look at it. They they basically say he was a great person. Especially today. And um, although, I mean, they're both timely and timeless. These are questions I'm sure people have grappled with for forever. Um, and, you know, questions of accountability. And if something does go wrong, if the system does get it wrong, will it endeavor to correct itself? You know, will That's someone... always the question. Yeah. So, you know, I was saying last night, it would be nice if when injustice is exposed, as it was, I believe, in the 1985 case, you know, would someone from the Manitowoc County Sheriff's Department or the prosecutor's office come forward and off, just offer an apology to Stephen Avery and say, you lost nearly two decades. Maybe they didn't feel he was owed an apology. Maybe they still felt he got they got it right. And and what if they were right? And what if you're wrong? What if uh, uh, what if it, what if it was innocence fraud that got Stephen Avery out the first time? Because. And we'll be going through it. There are certainly things that I find big red flags in, in that case, considering all the other cases of innocence fraud, in my opinion, that I've looked at. Decades of your life, your wife, your five children, your six day old twins. That man doesn't deserve an apology from the system. You know, and then the state's attorney general, she's the highest, you know, um, prosecutor in the state. She's in a position to investigate what went wrong and ultimately decides no criminal or ethics violations here. When you look at deposition videos... Wait, so do you do you want her to investigate it because she did? Or do you just want her to come to the conclusion that you've come to? And you have to remember, Laura Riccardi, according to Deb, Avery's friend, announced that she believed Avery was innocent right away, soon as she read the headline. It's in the federal case, and you understand how Eugene Couchet came to draw the composite of Stephen Avery in 1985, you know, or the fact that, um, you know, I mean, arguably the fact that there was a, a police officer who went and spoke to the sheriff of Manitowoc County and said, I think you have the wrong guy. It's not Stephen Avery. It's Gregory Allen. You know, so those are the things we're yeah. interested. Right. Just a reminder. So that's what we're going to look at. I think this is a good time to take a break. Go look at the, and when we return, we're going to look at a little bit of the original case and some of the things that make me raise an eyebrow in that case. Stay tuned. Meet you on the other side of the break. If you are enjoying this episode of my true crime report, please hit the thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and share this episode. Get access to exclusive podcasts and other bonus content by becoming a patron today. If you have a question or comment for me, shoot me a super chat and I'll do my best to answer it and read it on air. Thanks so much. Now back to the show. Okay. So, if you're listening to this episode, please hit the thumbs up. Leave me a comment. Uh, subscribe to the channel. There is more content, exclusive content in my Patreon. Become a Patreon member. There's a really fun episode up there now about Natalia Grace Barnett. Lots of other exclusive episodes, hangouts, 
fun to be had. Um, we're going to look at Avery's. This is from the appeal documents. Okay. So it goes through the burden, obviously the burden of proof. Okay. Here, reasonable probability. Okay. Having established the correct burden of proof, we next address the correct test under the fifth criterion for newly discovered evidence. Again, this criterion requires the defendant to prove by clear and convincing evidence that it's reasonably probable that a different result would have been reached by a new trial, right? So obviously that doesn't age well, but let's listen to some of their some of their issues with it. And you have to remember that the, this prosecutor prosecuted Allen two years before. And if it's true that everyone called to their attention, called, called this prosecutor's attention to the fact that this could be Gregory Allen, there has to be some reason that he thought that Allen wasn't a good candidate. And they keep saying, oh, they said he was on probation, but he wasn't on probation or he wasn't in custody. And I'd like to, I, is there, I'd like to learn more about that. What made them think that? I know they say a telephone call, but I haven't seen that really fleshed out. Okay. Okay, here we go. So having determined that the proper burden of proof and the proper test for reasonable probability, we now turn to Avery's claim that his newly discovered evidence satisfied this test. A motion for a new trial based on newly discovered evidence is addressed to the trial court's discretion. In support of his motion, Avery provided the trial court with the results of DNA testing establishing, this is in 1997, that the DNA in the fingernail scrapings. So if it's really true that they had this hair with a bulb on it, why did they want the why didn't they want that tested? And why instead were they asking just for Penny Bernstein's fingernail scrapings to be tested? that the DNA and the fingernail scrapings from Penny Bernstein were, quote, consistent with a mixture of DNA from Penny Bernstein and at least one other individual. The results also indicate that, quote, Avery cannot be excluded as a possible contributor to this mixed sample. However, there are additional alleles present which could not have been contributed by either of these individuals. Thus, the DNA evidence showed a mixture of DNA under PB, uh, Penny Bernstein's fingernails. They use PB, obviously. Certain aspects of the DNA matched both Penny Bernstein and Avery. Other aspects matched neither Penny Bernstein nor Avery. Thus, Avery contends that the DNA results suggest the presence of a third party. The trial court denied Avery's motion because the newly discovered evidence did not exclude Avery, and because the evidence at the trial and the post-conviction hearing revealed various other innocent sources of the additional DNA. Avery first points to the DNA expert testimony that a person's, quote, normal day-to-day, -day, unquote, day-to-day -day activity, unquote, excuse me, can cause the removal of DNA material from underneath the fingernails. Specifically, the expert testified that washing one's hands would be the most likely cause of removal. Based on this testimony, Avery, Avery argues that Penny Bernie, Bernstein's activity of jogging and splashing in the water just prior to the attack likely removed any pre-existing DNA sources from beneath her fingernails. 
between the time of the assault and the completion of the medical examination of the hospital. Avery argues that there were likely no incidents during which DNA could have been transferred. However, the DNA expert also testified that genetic material can be deposited under one fingernail during casual contact. Following Penny Bernstein's assault, she felt unable to walk. She crawled to a nearby beach where she was assisted by a man and a woman. The woman gave Penny Bernstein a towel and helped Penny Bernstein cover herself with it. The man and the woman then supported PB as they walked in the direction of the beach where PB had left her husband. When PB neared the beach, her husband approached, picked her up, carried her back towards the beach. PB then was then transported by ambulance to the hospital. There she was tended to by emergency personnel and her personal physician. While PB was in the emergency room, a nurse took her fingernail scrapings. Even assuming that PB washed away any pre-existing DNA prior to the attack, the state argues that a source of the DNA, such as a flake of skin, could have deposited under PB's fingernail during any one of her casual contacts with the towel, the man and woman who assisted her, her husband and hospital personnel. Thus the state reasons that the unified, unidentified DNA found under the attack could belong to any number of innocent sources, not just the perpetrator. As such, the state contends that, quote, the DNA which excluded the defendant and the victim as the source of the DNA really does not have much prob probative force in excluding the defendant as the assailant. And we agree with the state, as the trial court correctly observed, the DNA does did not exclude Avery. As a result, this evidence, if used at trial, would invite a fact finder to speculate about various possible sources of the DNA. So they're saying this isn't a DNA case, guys. And... So I think that's where we're going to stop it for today. I think I'm going to leave. But, you know, I hear people screaming about Avery's 16 alibi witnesses. We will we will come back to that. I will be going through this with a fine-tooth comb. I have a lot of questions, and I will keep asking them. Check back in here tomorrow, and I will leave you on a cliffhanger question. So... We know that Penny Bernstein incorrectly identified the, or if it, if it, if she were aiming to identify Stephen Avery, the perpetrator's eyes as having been brown, Stephen Avery's eyes are blue. But just to leave you on a cliffhanger, I'm going to ask you all a question. What color eyes what did or does Alan, Gregory Allen have? All right. We're going to be talking about that next time. Stay tuned. I'll see you back next time. Have a great day, everybody.